All right, Alexander, let's talk about what's going on in Afghanistan, of course. And uh, Kabul airport, we had a uh, situation there still a mess from what I from what I gather. But we do have uh, President Joe Biden speaking to the American people. And he says everything is under control. He, uh, he gave a, a press conference um, scripted, of course. Uh, he took a handful of questions. He said, uh, quote, um, it was a hard and painful evacuation, but it's going smoothly. That's just hard and painful, but going smoothly. He also said that he's going to put sanctions on Afghanistan, of course, because why not? Sanctions. That seems to be the uh, the solution for everything in uh, in the DC swamps eyes. But anyway, Alexander, what's uh, what's going on? Are things going uh, are, are things smooth? Are things going smoothly in uh, in Afghanistan? What's the latest? No, they're not going smoothly at all. They're going incredibly badly. And in fact, they're going so badly that we were receiving reports a few hours ago that the British, the Americans and various other people at Kabul airport were asking the Taliban for an extension of the 31st August deadline. A deadline, by the way, which Biden himself and the administration first imposed. They said that this would all be finished by the 31st of August. They didn't agree that with the Taliban. And now they're going to the Taliban, asking the Taliban to agree to extend that deadline. And literally... Uh, a minute before we started this program, I got the news on the BBC that the Taliban are refusing to extend the deadline. So why ask the Taliban to extend the deadline if things are going well? And of course, it also shows how utterly you, impotent you become, how powerless you become. You know, we're talking about the United States, we're talking about the NATO alliance, how powerless they become when they have to ask the Taliban for permission to stay in Kabul airport to get their own people out. It is a total, complete and absolute shambles. And I've also been hearing reports this morning, which is that there's been some kind of a firefight at one of the entrances to Kabul airport. It's not quite clear, clear who was involved or who attacked whom. It seems to have been Afghans shooting at each other. Apparently, some of the Afghan security guards who are leftovers from the previous military are still there and are still guarding the airport for the uh, uh, Americans and NATO as the evacuation continues. And I wonder, to be straightforward about it, how reliable these people actually are. But there you go. I mean, the whole thing has been a shambles and a disaster and a disgrace. And the president claiming otherwise is being completely out of touch with reality. One does wonder how informed, how well informed he actually is about what is really going on. And I ask again the question I have been asking now in programme after programme we have done. Who in Kabul airport is actually in charge? What is the name of the officer commanding? Because presumably there is one. Who is he? Uh, and where where is he? Is he commanding all this from Kabul airport or is he commanding it all from a desk in uh, CENTCOM, in, you know, Qatar, in Doha, or conceivably even in uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, we, we need to know these questions. We need to know who's in charge, who's making the decisions, and we need to have a much clearer understanding of what's actually going on there. And, of course, all of this comes after there's been admissions from the British government that they might not be able to get all their people out of Afghanistan. And after the Pentagon admitted that they don't even know where all their people are in Afghanistan or how many of them there are. So to talk about this going well is, as I said, absolutely surreal. Yeah, there are reports that um, the UK had sent paratroopers into Kabul to actually start to, to find UK citizens and other, and other citizens, other uh, uh, people working in, in Afghanistan who needed to get out. 
and get back to their country. And the report was that the that the U.S. government, the Biden administration, the Pentagon, I'm not sure which one, actually told them to stop doing it, which is really bizarre. Um, how is this all working at the airport? I've got a lot of questions as to what's going on. Um, people s- sitting on the wings of planes, uh, thousands of, of, of Afghans on the airport on a runway running next to a plane. Um, are people going to the airport, Alexander, and are they allowed to drive through and just go up to the airport and uh, and park their vehicles or, or get dropped off by by a taxi or so that I don't know, whatever, get dropped off. And then what? They're, they're showing their passports and they're getting on planes. There are reports that the planes are empty. There's photographs surfacing that these planes are leaving the airport empty. Why would a plane leave an airport empty, supposedly a plane that's transporting people? Why would it leave empty to begin with? Uh, there's just so many, so many questions. And I really feel like we're in a type of fog of war scenario without their, uh, um, r- really being a war, supposedly the war is over, but and, and the Taliban won, supposedly, but it seems like there's a fog of war scenario going on. I, I don't know. It's just, once again, it's, I'm looking at the photos, I'm looking at the videos, I'm trying to use logic, and I'm just, w- what is going on? How is this all working? Yeah, it, it is a fog of war scenario. Now, let's, let's just deal, first of all, with that story about British paratroopers being sent into Kabul in order to extract people and the United States vetoing. The reason that, I mean, first of all, it's important to say that this, this story, this information, which I am sure is true, uh, has only circulated informally. There's been no, advi- uh, no confirmation from the British Ministry of Defence or from the Pentagon or from the administration that that happened, but it's been so widely reported, at, this, at least in the British media, that I have no doubt about its truth. Now, the British wanted to send their paratroopers into Kabul. I think sending British paratroopers into Kabul by themselves with the Taliban there was an invitation, frankly, to a battle. I think the Americans, the administration, decided that if the British did go into Kabul, there would almost certainly be some kind of a firefight. And the Americans didn't want to have to send their people into Kabul to rescue the British. This has happened twice before. It happened in Basra, when the British uh, uh, in Iraq were fighting the Iraqis and the Americans had to come to their rescue then. And it happened in Helmand province in Afghanistan somewhat later, between 2006, 2009. And again, the British uh, got themselves into trouble. And again, the United States military had to go in to extricate them. So I think this is what we're seeing. We're seeing the British under enormous pressure domestically uh, because they, the British have taken this defeat, and they are calling it straightforwardly here, a defeat extremely badly. And there's a lot of political pressure on the government to be seen to be taking strong action. And the Americans, who are determined to get out with as little harm and damage to themselves as possible, do not want to get drawn into a battle in Kabul itself because the British are there and the British have got themselves into trouble. And I'm pretty sure that there are some people in Washington also, who may think that the British are going, wanted to go into Kabul precisely in order to get the Americans to intervene in Kabul, precisely in order, perhaps, even at this very late moment, to get this entire withdrawal reversed. So I, I, I think there's a lot going on, and I wasn't surprised that the US vetoed it. And I have to say, I think the decision to send British paratroopers into Kabul in that kind of way would would have been a complete act of folly. Now, in every other respect, all the other points you're making are absolutely t- valid and true. I'm also hearing that a lot of those planes are leaving empty. I'm also hearing that a lot of the people who are ending up in Kabul airport are people who are from, you know, just ordinary Afghans. You know, they may not want to live under the Taliban, but the American and the British and the German troops who are there have no particular reason to want to help them. They are there first and foremost to help their own citizens, or so they say, and other people who worked with 
the American uh, uh, and NATO forces in Afghanistan and who might therefore be subject to reprisal. So there's massive confusion about who is there. And the people who are going to Kabul airport have to pass Taliban checkpoints. The Taliban are able to check who goes in. The Taliban, to a great extent, are controlling this entire process. And the extent to which any of these people have papers is debatable. And, of course, the extent to which there's any biometric data that can be used in substitution for papers is debatable also given that apparently a lot of the databases storing the the biometric data were left behind in Kabul itself. So it is a complete mess. It's a disaster. Nobody knows what's going on. Nobody has any idea who many of these people are. There's no discipline or control on the runways, or very little, and no uh, no real uh, sense of anyone in charge. Why doesn't the uh, Biden administration, in coordination with with other countries that have citizens in Afghanistan, why don't they communicate with the Taliban and the Taliban leaders and open up some uh, corridors to the airport? And they're the ones that are checking uh, people's documents, because if... if We know now the Taliban is controlling the, uh, the, the situation on the ground, that's the way it appears. And so they're controlling uh, the people that are going in and out from the airport. Why, why would you want the Taliban checking people's documents and their passports to, to enter the airport? That doesn't make any sense at all. If anything, if Biden wanted to show, the Biden White House wanted to show that they have everything under control, then they would get CNN and MSNBC and their media stooges there, New York Times, Washington Post. They would speak with their allies, organize things, and they would open up some corridors into the airport. And if uh, and they would have their military there, checking people's documents, passing them into the passing them through into the airport if they're okay, filling up the planes, and the planes are leaving. I mean, that would that would be the sensible thing. Instead, what I'm seeing are people running, people on the runways, literally running next to planes. I'm seeing Taliban military controlling who comes in and out of the airports, which suggests that it's the Taliban that are looking at people's documents and their passports and judging where whether they're American or British or French or whatever and passing them through. This is this is completely bizarre and uh, poorly managed, to say the least. I don't know. Am I am I saying stuff that is making sense or is this impossible? you're making complete sense. And can I just say, just uh, just a few hours before you uh, uh, asked me these questions, I was reading reports again about how the administration, the president, was now talking about opening up corridors to the airport exactly in the way that you said he should. The trouble is that he wants or has spoken about the need for Taliban cooperation to do that. And the Taliban are not cooperating anymore. And the reason the Taliban are not cooperating is because they no longer fear the United States. And why would they fear the United States when they see the total and complete and utter shambles that is now uh, uh, there before their eyes in Kabul airport? They no longer have any reason to make concessions or to make agreements about corridors, extensions and anything like that. Because from their point of view, they've won. The United States is retreating and the United States is retreating in disgrace. I mean, this is one of the most astonishing things I've ever seen. And whether the United States, whether the administration can get a grip on the situation now, whether whether they're prepared to push the Taliban aside, open those corridors themselves, send more troops into Afghanistan, make the kind of threats to the Taliban in return for Taliban cooperation, which they ought arguably to be making. And, you know, I'm, I'm a peaceful man. I don't believe in threats and belligerency as a general rule. But sometimes, sometimes when you have to extricate your people, things like that have to be done. That's not to say that you don't want to go back into Afghanistan. It's all about 
carrying out a proper, orderly, organized evacuation. But they're not doing any of those things. And by the way, your your mentions of the media speak of themselves. If things really were under control at the airport, they would have the media there. They'd have the media, the BBC, CNN, MSNBC, they'd all be at Kabul airport with their cameras, able to film, able to interview people, talking to people, showing to the world how orderly and well organized this operation was and how well efficiently it was being carried out. And we would know the name of the officer in charge. And he, no doubt, would be setting aside part of his day, not a long part of his day, but some part of his day to answer questions. Because answering questions and communicating people, as we all know, those of us who've done it, is an essential part of sound management. The fact that none of those things are happening suggests to me that nobody's in charge, nobody's really in charge in Kabul. And what you're getting is that nobody is getting a grip on the situation because nobody wants to come close and be involved in what is clearly looking like a debacle. So they're running away, they're keeping away from this disaster, and in the meantime, things just go Go on, get it going from bad to worse. No, Biden is lying. Straight out, he's lying. When he gets in front of the American people and says things are going smoothly, he's lying. But well, th- yeah, that's how I pictured it. That's how I pictured it. You know, the the, the stooge media next to next to these checkpoints, and I could see the CNN uh, operative sitting there and saying, "Look, everything is orderly. Here is uh, um, Lieutenant Major General, whatever, um, John Smith." Checking the passports of people coming in. Here's the corridor. The cameras show the corridor. There's the airport over there. And as you guys can see, as the president said, everything's going smoothly. We don't have that. We don't have any of that. Instead, what we have are social media videos. And I don't even know if I can believe those videos. I I don't know. I just don't know what the hell's going on. And this is what I mean by the fog of war. So... The Taliban doesn't uh, doesn't want to cooperate with the United States. You say they don't fear the United States. Uh, maybe if Biden would have jumped on this seven days ago and talked to the Taliban and negotiated with the Taliban, anticipating that they would have a bottleneck at the airport because they're the dummies that closed down the other airport in Bagram, then maybe the Taliban would have already had uh, cord- uh, corridors opened for the American uh, personnel, the UK personnel, whatever, to, to get through to the airport and get on a plane and leave. And the situation would be solved, but they delayed. Okay, fine. Absolutely. So now they're, in, now they're in this mess. They've delayed everything. Now you say Biden is saying he, they're coordinating, they're trying to coordinate with the Taliban in order to get corridors, but the Taliban's ignoring them. So then maybe the Biden administration should talk to the one country that actually has um, a line with the Taliban, maybe two countries, maybe Pakistan is another one, but maybe they should be speaking with the Russians. But then again, you come back to the fact that the Biden White House is going to have to give concessions to the Russians in order for the Russians to put some pressure on the Taliban. And then you come back and you say, well, maybe you idiot Biden and you dumb ass script writers of Biden and Mr. Stephanopoulos, you shouldn't have called Putin a killer way back when or kept on calling them thugs, or passed sanctions on Russia, for which you passed sanctions just the other day on Nord Stream. Again, again, you need the Russians' help, but you passed sanctions on Nord Stream literally two days ago. So, what the, what the F? What the F? Well, you're, you, well, you're absolutely right. Well, let, 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 let's, that was let's a bit of a rant, but I mean, the whole thing's well, just it's, a it's, complete it's, mess. It, 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 it's, it's not a rant. It's an absolutely meaningful one. And can I make one first point before I deal with your other points, which is that you were the absolute first person that I know of, the absolute first person I know of to mention the stupidity of abandoning Bagram first and getting yourself into this mess in Kabul airport. Now it's all over the media. Clearly they all follow us at the Duran because now everybody is asking that very same question that you asked, was it a week ago, two weeks ago? I'm, you know, I, I'm when they, when, when they first When they first closed the airport in July, we exactly. talked about it in a exactly. video. Exactly. We exactly. talked about it. We said, we talked about I remember it. We, yeah. were, we were sitting there looking at each other saying, this is really yeah. weird. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, 
just saying that because, as I said, I mean, you know, if we don't mention the point that we said it first, who else is going to? So, I mean, I think in justice and in fairness, I, I, I think that needs to be said. But no, absolutely. What they should have done when it looked as if Kabul was going to fall is that somebody senior, Kamala Harris, the vice president, Anthony Blinken, uh, the secretary of state, Jake Sullivan, you know, the national security advisor. Well, obviously, all of these people, we know what they really are. But I mean, you know, if, if, if this had been a joint, uh, a joined up administration, someone senior, maybe the defense secretary, maybe the secretary of state, maybe the national security advisor would have gone to Kabul, spoken with both the Afghan government representatives, the ones of the, the Afghan government representatives who were losing power, and also with the Taliban, and come to some kind of formal, proper agreement to organise this withdrawal. I mean, that should have been, by the way, an actual agreement, not a, not a case of, you know, coming along afterwards and saying, please, please, Mr. Taliban, can we have another two week extension on all of this? I mean, you know, th th that's what you do. I mean, that's if you're if you're a superpower, if you are a serious government, that is what you do. Notice that none of these people that we're talking about, Kamala Harris, Lloyd Austin, Anthony Blinken, Jake Sullivan, have gone anywhere close to Kabul. None of them are going there. None of them are coming and, uh, and taking control of the situation and are speaking to any of the people there, are, direct, are in direct touch with the Taliban or, 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 or with anyone else on the ground, or are even showing any interest, any real interest in finding out what is going on on the ground. And as I said, we don't still know, at least I don't know, who is the person who is in actual charge of the operation at the moment at Kabul airport or what the rank of that person is. Now, as to talking to the Russians, and you're right, it would have to be the Russians because though the Chinese have an embassy in Kabul, uh, they don't really seem to be directly in touch with the Taliban in Kabul itself. And Pakistan is in a position to do lots of things uh, uh, at various times. But it's quite clear that it's the Russians at the moment who have been doing most of the running in the negotiations with the Taliban. Well, of course, one should be speaking to them. I mean, that is almost, shall I say, a um, obligation at a moment like this, that you talk to the people who actually have leverage over the Taliban, because the Taliban are very keen to get the Russians and the Chinese on side, because they need the at least the acquiescence of the Russians and the Chinese if they're going to stabilise Afghanistan and consolidate their government. So you talk to the people who have actual leverage over the Taliban, which is the Russians and to a lesser extent at this moment, the Pakistanis, and do what you can with the Russians and the Pakistanis to try to get the Taliban to cooperate. And of course, you don't just do that. You have the, you know, the velvet glove of diplomacy. You have the mailed fist also. You make, you make the necessary threats. You tell people, you know, look, if you don't cooperate, we are the United States. We have all the means that we need. We can take action and will take action to protect our citizens. We don't want to do that. We want an orderly, structured withdrawal. We need your cooperation. Uh, uh, the Russians are there. The Pakistanis are there. Maybe the Chinese to a certain extent also, and we can do it, we can organise it, and they can mediate it, and they can supervise it for us. That's what you do. They're not doing that. They don't want to talk to the Russians, because that would be altogether too humiliating. By the way, I don't think the Russians would actually, at a juncture like this, insist on very great concessions. I don't think they'd say to the United States, well, look, you know, uh, we're, help we're happy to help you in Kabul, but in return you must lift sanctions on X, Y, Z, for example. I don't think that's what the Russians would do. But it would be an utter humiliation to speak to the Russians. It would be completely uh, um, go against completely the whole line of Western policy towards Russia in exactly the way you, you said. And they don't have either the guts 
or perhaps even the imagination to do it. So again, the situation is spiralling out of control. About, about a couple of days ago, Blinken did pick up the telephone and call Lavrov. And he also spoke, by the way, to Wang Yi, the Chinese foreign minister. And apparently Wang Yi gave him a ticking off, basically said, you know, you got Afghanistan completely wrong. And we're not absolutely sure what Lavrov and Lavrov said or what Blinken said to Lavrov. But whatever, nothing clearly of any substance was agreed. And when your obligations are to your own people, it should be very clear about this. Those obligations should override everything else. They should override issues of face and they should certainly override issues of, you know, grand uh, policy and sanctions and all the rest. And you're absolutely right. Biden is indeed talking about sanctions on Afghanistan. That's now the default answer to every problem, it would seem. <laughs> sanctions on Afghanistan, like I said uh, in my rant earlier, Alexander, the, the the dummies at the White House, they placed sanctions on uh, on Nord Stream 2 again. Two, two days ago, an executive order. Exactly. At, at well, a yeah, moment that, uh, where they have this massive crisis and they need as many friends and allies and goodwill because they've bungled things up. What do they do? An executive order to put sanctions on Nord Stream 2. Russia, German businesses, Russian businesses, just complete stupidity. Absolutely. Complete stupidity and a complete lack of understanding of underlying priorities. I mean, the Russians are angry about it. The Germans are furious about it. It's not going to stop Nord Stream 2. That's uh, 15 kilometers from its, you know, the, the building is almost there. It's almost finished. But um, nonetheless, that's what they do. Uh, insult and infuriate the very people who might otherwise be there to help you get out of the mess you've got yourself into in Afghanistan and in Kabul. This is going to have long-term consequences, by the way. A lot of people around the world are watching this horrified, shocked, angry, and they're going to say to themselves, well, the United States not only can't be trusted in, its, in what it says, but it can't be trusted even to manage these things efficiently. When once upon a time, it so could. I mean, once upon a time, as I said in an earlier program, I can remember the days in the, you know, when I was a child, we were, what we were all in awe of American efficiency. And all that's now gone down the tubes. Yeah, it already is having long-term consequences. Uh... You know, what can you say? Uh, Biden is not taking calls from Boris Johnson. He's avoiding speaking with Boris Johnson. Uh, Trudeau is speaking with Hillary Clinton. Uh, it's, it's, we're going to do a video on, uh, on the UK uh, politicians and parliaments that are turning on Biden. It's already having very long term consequences. Putin is speaking with uh, Macron. He's speaking with Draghi. He's speaking with uh, uh, the president of Kazakhstan. Uh, to, Torpikov, I believe is his name. No, absolutely. And, 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 uh, and Uzbekistan and Tajikistan. And he received Erdogan. Merkel. Erdogan. He, he had Merkel in Moscow the other day. He speaks regularly, as we know, to Xi Jinping. The Chinese and the Russian foreign ministers coordinate with each other. Merkel's, Putin's also spoken to the Iranian president. Uh, 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 they're in contact with Pakistan. They're about to receive the foreign minister of India. <laughs> All of this is going on. And in Washington, it's radio silence. Yeah, in Washington, the prime minister of the UK, their greatest ally, is getting snubbed by the Biden administration. It's, it's, I can't even believe what I'm seeing. The, the prime minister of Canada is speaking with Hillary Clinton. What the F is going on, everybody? What is going on? Well, this, is, this is beyond nuts. Yeah. Well, if you want to compare end of empire moments, and which is we were talking about Putin, and there's been a lot of, lot of stories said about Putin, but this one is true because it originates with the man himself. When he was in East Germany in 1989 and everything was falling apart for the Soviet Union there, and they were also looking to make all kinds of decisions and worried about people breaking into uh, Soviet installations. Uh, Putin was asking, you know, what can we do? What, what, what are we doing? Who's in charge? And he received uh, uh, a message 
that Moscow is silent. Moscow is silent. Everything's falling apart in East Germany and Moscow is silent. Well, that was the beginning of the end of the Soviet Union and of the Soviet system in Europe, uh, the Soviet empire, if you will. Well, we have exactly the same situation in Afghanistan and this time it's Washington, which is silent. So end of empire moment, parallels, if you like. I mean, just saying. <laughs> All right, we'll leave it there, guys. The Durand.locals.com. Definitely check us out on the Durand.locals.com and the Durand shop. 10% off. Use the code Real News. I've got a Russia t shirt, I've got a USA bug. You've got a Durand sweatshirt. Or Indeed, a, 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 sweatshirt and, and a t shirt underneath. This one has the flag of Scotland there. Scotland. And, yes. I've, and of course, I've also got my Durand mug next to me. All right. And uh, Odyssey, Bitchute, Rumble, and Super U. You'll find all our videos there. Take care.